Segment three, number seven. The London Telegraph recently published its list of the 100 most influential conservatives in America. Roger Ailes came in at position seven. That's ahead of former President George W. Bush, ahead of Chief Justice John Roberts, and ahead of presidential candidates Governor Tim Pawlenty and former Governor Mitt Romney. On the other hand, I have to break it to you, you came in just behind Glenn Beck. So here you are, the director of a... Glenn's actually not a conservative, and I would argue that n in 40 years, nobody's ever asked my position on an issue. They have no idea what I believe about certain issues. So you reject this outright? I do, because I think you have to know, just like in a poll, you have to know how the question was asked, and so what are the de what's their definition of a conservative? Uh, I, am, I tend to be conservative. I, drew, I grew up in... Ohio during Taft uh, time and, and so on and, and the Eisenhower era. Uh, so I tend to be conservative on, on many issues, certainly on national security. And, and uh, I, I would probably qualify, but I'm not anywhere near a radical. Okay, let's talk about the effect, the Fox effect. And whose term am I using? I'm using the 44th president of the United States term. He called it the Fox effect. Barack Obama said that the Fox effect probably cost him a couple of points in the election, and Democratic political consultant James Carville said recently that, quote, if Roger Ailes were a Democrat, there would be 67 Democratic senators right now instead of 59. 68, but go ahead. 68? I, I, respect, <laughs> I respect James, but uh, when I used to do that for a living, I was pretty good at it. Okay, so... Here you have the President of the United States and others, including the extremely intelligent James Carville, saying Fox News shapes the nation's politics. Well, are that's you their pleased? fault. Are you appalled? Oh, go no, ahead. That's their fault. I mean, what we do is we go on the air every day with, with uh, two points of view in the news. Um, Glenn Beck has a phone on his set that says, if I make any factual errors, please call me so I can correct them immediately and apologize. And the phone never rings because what he's saying is apparently true. Um, we have been 13 years on the air. In our 14th year, we've never taken a story down because of factual problems. Right. Paul Starr, journalist writing in the current issue of The Atlantic. This is a longish quote, but he gets at something interesting. I want to see how you respond. Quote, not since the 19th century have presidents had to deal with partisan media of this kind. Here he's referring to cable news. Today, the media saturate American life far more fully than they did early in American history. Now, here we go. When Cronkite gives way to Beck, political leadership loses a consensus-building partner. This is the problem that faces Obama, close quote. Cable news fractures the media. The president can no longer command the attention of the entire nation. He's got this niche operation, that niche operation, and Fox News over here attacking, attacking, attacking. It's a new kind of problem that a president hasn't had to face before. Well... Spiro Agnew didn't like the media either, and he went off on nattering nabobs of whatever. N ne neg negativism. Right, negativism. Right. And now we hear the president saying it's all the cable news fault. What about the other cable news channels that endorse everything and, and cheer? I mean, they get up and applaud. He stood up at the radio TV dinner and he said, I know you all voted for me, and they stood up cheering. Of course they did. Right. So, uh, you know, if I, I once asked somebody, I went to one of those seldom that I go to parties, but I, somebody started on me about Fox News being conservative, and I said, are you comfortable with CNN and MSNBC? And he said, absolutely. And I said, what about NBC, ABC, and CBS? He said, fine. I said, PBS, NPR, no problem. I said, uh, New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times. He said, great. I said, so, but this little cable channel called Fox is somehow ruining your life. I said, keep in mind, the last two guys to get all of them lined up together were Hitler and Stalin. That did not work out well for people. So if, if, to be honest with you, if all the media tipped to the right, I'd, I'd be the you biggest be. liberal in New York. I mean, I don't think, the American people have got to understand that everything the government does costs money, and there are only two places to get it, their wallet or to print it. And if they print it, it reduces the amount of money in their wallet. That's it. And so they get a right to have a voice in those things. Politicians don't like that because the way they get reelected is to spend money, spend the American people's money. 
and you're seeing some people begin to rebel. So when you think of when you think of the way the press treated Richard Nixon, when you think of the way the press treated George W. Bush, do you subscribe to the statement of your news uh, host Chris Wallace that the Obama administration is the biggest bunch, he said, the biggest bunch of crybabies that he's dealt with in his 30 years in Washington. Well, that was they're his, whining over nothing. Well, I, I don't think they're whining over nothing, and I think they have, look, there's legitimate complaints that they can have, and I've had this dialogue uh, with David Axelrod, who I like very much, and uh, there are legitimate areas. I mean, Chris said that, that's his words, that's what he believed, and he had reason to believe that. Right. But I don't think it's helpful to say that. I mean, Richard Nixon got himself into trouble, and he got a lot of press because he went to war with the press, which is never helpful. Uh, uh, George W. Bush probably could have been more articulate about some of the things he was doing, although in retrospect, the main successes in the Obama administration is where he's copying what George W. Bush did. I mean, he's having problems everywhere else. Right. Uh, but... Uh, and I, I, you know, I'm not m taking sides here on either one. I would love for uh, Barack Obama to uh, to understand uh, that Americans are worried. They're worried about their national security. Uh, they're worried about government spending. Um, yeah, they're worried about health care. But let me give you an example. And yeah. I tried to say this: the 300,000 people, roughly, but not quite that, 270, 280 who have health care they like. There are 300 30, million. 300, 300 million. million. Right, right, right. Three, there are 30 million who don't. So if you're an executive, where do you go to solve that problem? Do you go o upset the 300 million who are happy? Or do you go over here and try to fix, maybe get a public-private partnership between insurance and the government to take care of the 30 who need it? We didn't do that because the health care plan was a voter registration plan. Right. As long as you can get 300 million people getting a check from the government, they're going to vote a certain way. Right. It, 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 one party government doesn't work. It worked in Chicago, but it doesn't work for the country. Every time you have a poverty city, you have one party government. That's Chicago, true. Newark, Baltimore, Cleveland, Baltimore. It, it, you can't have one party, and it doesn't matter which party. I mean, Republicans sometimes steal big things like Enron and things like that, but they tend not to steal cities. Corruption and leadership are the two biggest problems in America today. Uh, the corruption is a problem, and the fact that people just won't step up and lead is another problem. 